Namaste, David. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Thank you so much for making time. Uh, so as with everyone else, I would ask you, what is your earliest memory of either the idea or the experience of nonviolence from childhood? Um, <clears throat> my dad was a uh, Protestant Christian pastor. And he often uh, gave sermons on uh, loving your enemy. And uh, who is my neighbor? Uh, the Good Samaritan story. And um, when I was in uh, perhaps uh, second or third grade in Iowa uh, in the winter, I had to walk through the uh, park between my school and, and our home. <clears throat> and uh, one day, uh, some boys uh, started uh, hitting me with ice balls. Uh, India, India, most people probably don't know what ice balls are. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, it was snow packed together, and then uh, and they started throwing them at my at my face. And I. Uh, uh, I had heard my, my father's sermon about loving your enemy. And uh, I said to these uh, fellows, I, they kept throwing. And I said, well, you know, I, uh, I want to be your friend. I don't have anything against you. And I did not throw anything at them. And I was bleeding a little bit. Uh, and uh, finally they stopped. It was not much fun. <laughs> hitting this guy with ice balls. Uh, and uh, later they became very good friends. So at the age of, uh, what, seven, seven or eight, I, uh, I think I began to understand that uh, nonviolence and love was not something you just do to your friends, you can do to your enemies, and then they're no longer enemies. Indeed. Indeed. And when you grew up, is it true that it was a meeting with Martin Luther King that set you on the path? I've heard that you once heard him speak. Was it that and or your uh, becoming a Quaker? Mm. What as well, a grown up put you on this path? <laughs> well, um, my my dad uh, took me to Montgomery, Alabama during the Montgomery bus boycott in 1956, uh, where we met Martin Luther King and met the people that were walking to work every day rather than ride the segregated buses. And uh, even the, the black churches were being bombed. Uh, but instead of uh, responding with, with violence or hatred, uh, they said, we're not going to burn the, uh, the white people's churches. <laughs> uh, that's, that's not who we are. You know, we're all God's children. And so anyway, that uh, had a very great impact on me. Uh, Nonviolence, not just as a philosophy or a, uh, uh, but it was a way of, uh, a, of relating to other people, and it was a means of struggle. Mm. So it, it was a powerful means of trying to challenge the horrible racism and uh, segregation in the South of the United States. Mm. So that certainly had a uh, very great impact on me. But what was the decisive uh, experience that decided that you were going to dedicate your life to this path, which you have? Well, I think there were a number of things. Um, when, uh, when I was 17, uh, my uh, mother and father gave me this little book by uh, Mahatma Gandhi, All Men Are Brothers. I think he would probably say all people are children of God now <laughs> instead of all men are brothers. But um, so that was, had a very great impact on me. Um, <clears throat> of course, meeting Martin Luther King. But, uh, and then when I was in high school, some uh, young women 
from Hiroshima and Nagasaki came to my school and showed a film uh, called Children of the A-Bomb, where they, um, <clears throat> the, uh, it showed the horrors of that war, uh, destroying everything and people, hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, then after the film, and they had been burned by the, uh, by the bo nuclear bomb, so their faces were disfigured. Uh, but they said, we of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, who, have, who have faced this horror of, of nuclear weapons, we want to do everything in our power to make sure this never happens to anybody ever again. And I just thought, Wow, you know, it's instead of hatred, instead of revenge, instead of saying we're going to get back to these people that killed our families and destroyed our cities, uh, they said we want to make sure that this never happens to anyone ever again. And uh, that made a very, very great impression on me. And then the, the uh, thing which <clears throat> made even a greater impact on me perhaps was uh, in college, I, I went to, to Howard University, which is a uh, African-American university. Washington, DC. In Washington, DC. And um, so I was there starting the fall of 1959. So in early 1960, when uh, four students in Greensboro, North Carolina, African-American students, went to, they decided <clears throat> they had had it with segregation. <laughs> they could not, no longer tolerate this. They went and sat at a lunch counter, uh, uh, to a restaurant to get something to eat. And instead of getting something to eat, they were arrested. That was a, uh, <clears throat> that was a wake up call for thousands of young African-American people across the United States mm -hmm. to go and challenge segregation in their, in their uh, towns and cities. What year was this, David? 1960, okay. Fe February of 1960. So uh, <clears throat> at Howard University in Washington, uh, in Maryland, Virginia, which surrounds uh, Washington, uh, we discovered everything was still segregated even African ambassadors from the UN, when they were driving from Washington to New York or vice versa, could not eat along the highway. That's 1960. That's, that's just, uh, what, 60 years ago. And so we started going to lunch counters in Maryland to try to get something to eat, my black friends and me. And, uh, so every Saturday morning when we would do that, uh, they would arrest us and we would go to jail. And instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, <laughs> we sang freedom songs and, uh, and strengthened our spirits for uh, the, the long struggle still ahead. Well, the state of Virginia had passed a law saying anyone that who challenged segregation in Virginia could get a... Uh, six months in jail and a $500 fine. And so we kept going to Maryland because that was just a weekend in jail. But after we finished our final exams, examinations in June of 1960, we, did, uh, we decided someone had to challenge segregation in, in the state of Virginia. Mm. We, we got additional nonviolence training where we uh, role played uh, the, the American Nazi party were down in Virginia and threatening violence to anyone that challenged segregation. So we went to a, what was called a people's drug store, sat down uh, to get some, ask for something to eat. They closed the lunch counter and uh, the owner didn't want the publicity. So he uh, did, decided not to arrest us but he also would give us nothing to eat, eat or drink. So we sat there for two days waiting for something to eat and uh, 
during this two days, it was the most challenging of my life. People came and, and, and spat at our faces. They, uh, let cig they put lit cigarettes down our shirts. They uh, punched us in the stomach so hard we would uh, fall down on the floor and they would kick us. Uh, the American Nazi party came with their swastikas. And each time we, we tried to respond in a loving, nonviolent way. Uh, toward the end of the second day, I was sitting there uh, reading from the New Testament about loving your enemy. <laughs> and I heard this guy come up from behind me and he said, if you don't get out of this store in two seconds, I'm gonna stab this through your heart. And in his hand was a switchblade, a knife. And, and it was shaking like this, you know, a half an inch from my heart. And I, I decided I have two seconds to decide, do I really believe in nonviolence? Or <laughs> is there some other way to deal with this guy with so much hatred? And we'd had a lot of experience and I just looked him in the eye and I said, friend, uh, do what you believe is right, but I'll still try to love you. And it was miraculous, this face, face that was contorted with hatred. His jaw began to drop and his, 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 his knife in his hand that, that was just right next to my heart began to, to, to fall and he left the store. So at age 20, uh, that was probably the most exper important experience of my life that uh, in terms of the power of nonviolence, that uh, somehow um, he discovered in my loving response to him that I was also a human being <laughs> and, so, and that he was a, a human being <laughs> and, yeah. and they wanted to you know, relate to me as a child of God rather than as an enemy. Well, I will finish the story in one second. Uh, we, uh, there were 500 people outside with rocks and threatening violence with us. Um, and we got out, we made a statement to the appealing to the religious and community leaders of Arlington, Virginia, to use their influence to get the eating facilities open to everyone. Mm. And this was the hard part, we said, if nothing changes within, uh, within a week, we'll be back. <laughs> and that was pretty hard to say, we'll, we'll be back. Um, and some friendly media people got us out, 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 out alive. And we went back to Howard and literally shook for six days whether we had the courage to do this again. And on the sixth day, we got a phone call that the religious and community leaders of Arlington had met, had made an appeal to the business leaders to open up the eating facilities. And within 10 days, uh, the uh, uh, eating facilities in, in Virginia or in, Mar in Arlington were open to everyone. So that was the most important experience of my life when something terrible is happening you don't have to just curse the television set or the president or segregation or racism or war. You find some other people who believe as deeply as you do in something and uh, get some nonviolent training and, and go and challenge it, you know, nonviolently, lovingly. And um, that's what I've been trying to do the rest of my life is, <laughs> is and Gandhi, I believe, Gandhi talked about his life as my experiments with truth. Yeah. And uh, I think my life has been experiments with uh, the power of nonviolence to try to challenge injustice and uh, violence and war. Indeed. Is this what then led you to travel to many countries that were officially meant, said to be enemy countries of the US? I mean, you have been known from an early age to cross borders, to meet people who were deemed to be or claimed to be 
the enemies of america is that what inspired you to you know to do that and and did you do that through war resistors or was there a kind of a institutional framework for those travels which you did well um I think I got experience. I got exposed to injustice and uh, racism and segregation in the United States, and then uh, actually in 1959, right after the Cuban Revolution, I, I went to a Quaker work camp in uh, in uh, Cuba, mm. and uh, was helping rebuild a, a a village that had been destroyed. Uh, by Batista, um, and I, there I discovered the terrible injustice, uh, the uh, how the United States had had used Cuba as a place to get sugarcane and <laughs> and the various resources, and they were living very poorly. And I th so I that opened me up to the injustice in the world. Um, I had also uh, lived in a cooperative uh, intentional community where one of the people had, had traveled to India and gotten to know uh, many who worked with Gandhi, Vinoba Bhave and uh, Jay Prakash Narayan and others, and uh, came home and told these stories. <laughs> and um, anyway, and I had studied international relations, and at that time, the United States and the Soviet Union were threatening each other with nuclear war. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we still are with Russia. Planes were in the air all the time with nuclear weapons flying toward Russia, yeah. and vice versa. And uh, it was very, very dangerous. So I uh, thought, I want to get to know these people <laughs> who are we're ready to, to, to blow them up, kill everybody. Uh, so I uh, went and studied in Berlin, uh, East and West Berlin that was divided in 1961, where we were uh, threatening nuclear war over Berlin. I heard that you could go camping in the Soviet Union. So we went to, uh, <clears throat> uh, we took a camping trip 6,000 miles through the Soviet Union, just getting to know the Russian people. And, uh, you know, it was the early days of citizen diplomacy mm. where, you know, if the government leaders are threatening <laughs> to kill each other, but we as the just common people mm. can get to know each other, not as communists or capitalists or, you know, uh, good people versus bad people, but just as, as, as human beings, as children of God, mm -hmm. um, we can build peace from below. Yeah. And um, then just uh, believing deeply that instead of uh, uh, threatening each other with nuclear war, threatening each other with, uh, with uh, we could kill more of your people than you could kill of ours, so we will win. That, that this was, was just an insane way of looking at the world. And, and that instead we need to really look at how we can resolve conflict peacefully. And so I, as I had learned in Montgomery, Alabama and Arlington, Virginia uh, about the power of nonviolence, uh, I think I became inspired about how can we uh, resolve our conflicts nationally and internationally uh, non-violently yeah. uh, through negotiation rather than threatening each other with uh, how many of your people we could kill. And so um, I, I, got, uh, I, I went to countries that were in war zones mm -hmm. uh, together with other people and with Witness for Peace and Peace Brigades International, right. uh, Christian peacemaker teams and uh, where, I mean, as most of your listeners probably know, in wars today, 80% of the people that are killed are civilians. They're not soldiers. They're innocent 
men, women, and children, grandparents, uh, babies. And uh, so we discovered that if international people go and be present with the people, in the, with the civilians in these areas of conflict, that the death squads or the governments, whoever are, are, are killing these people, they don't like to do that if, if international people are present. And not with guns, <laughs> but just with their bare bodies. And so um, we did that in, the cent in Central America in the 80s uh, with the wars that were going on. The United States was supplying the weapons. Uh, so anyway, and we, we discovered that we could save lots of lives by just going and being present. So that was... Uh, you, uh, you also set up a campaign to prevent or to stop the munitions trains going into yes. Central America. Yeah. Was that, yeah. were you able to stop some of the armaments from reaching those zones? Well, um, during the Vietnam War, uh, we started blocking ships that were carrying bombs to uh, Vietnam, napalm and an anti-personnel bombs, et cetera. We were in canoes, <laughs> small, tiny boats, uh, literally putting our bodies between these bombs and the people in Vietnam that would get killed. And um, <clears throat> the first ship that we uh, blocked in New Jersey uh, the, uh, it was called the USS Nitro. And we were there six days in front of the ship as they loaded it with, with uh, bombs. And on the, the, some of the sailors told us that on the seventh day, they were going to leave for Vietnam. And uh, as we were paddling our boats to try to stay right in front of the ship, uh, we looked up on the, the, the bow of the ship and here seven of the sailors jumped off of the ship and into the Atlantic Ocean and began uh, swimming toward us. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, it's, it's, it's a longer story, but they were picked up by the, uh, by the Coast Guard or by the Navy and put in the brig of the ship. But they told us later that when their ship went through the Panama Canal on the way to, uh, to Vietnam, the other Navy ships had heard about their ship and gave them the fist of solidarity. And about that time, uh, the uh, resistance of US soldiers to, to fighting that war really increased significantly. And so I'd like to think that our courage gave courage to these seven sailors to uh, disobey orders. <laughs> they said, we're not going to Vietnam with this shipload of bombs. Their courage gave courage to a lot of other soldiers to also uh, refuse to participate in this mm. madness of uh, killing you know, thousands, millions of women and children because uh, we, we, our government didn't like their government. So, uh, and later uh, during the wars in Central America, we blocked trains that were carrying uh, bombs and munitions right. to uh, ships that were going to Vietnam, uh, to uh, Central America. Mm -hmm. And for two and a half years, we uh, blocked every train carrying bombs and munitions. Uh, sometimes they would have to arrest two uh, bus loads of us, <laughs> put us in, in handcuffs, uh, take us to jail uh, before they, these trains could go through. So the, our message to our government was, uh, you have three choices. You can either uh, stop these trains that are carrying bombs and munitions to kill our brothers and sisters in Central America, or you can arrest us and uh, if you arrest us, as soon as we get out of jail, we'll be back to block again. Or uh, you can run over us. And unfortunately, they did. Uh, the, the first train that came after we started this blockade 
uh, ran over my my good friend Brian Wilson, um, and it cut off his both his legs and a big hole in his head, and broke many many bones, but he survived. And I, he had said, "Our lives are not worth more," and the people in Central America, other parts of the world, are not worth less. What's well, a very radical way of looking at the world? Because I mean, we, I think, as Americans, we're often led to think we are most important. You know, you know, I, we fight wars for oil, and you know, how did our oil get underneath their sand? <laughs> or, <laughs> they they have the resources we need for our computers, so you know, of course, we can. We have a right to those resources, et cetera. Well, Brian's idea was totally different. Our lives are not worth more. Their lives are not worth less. And at um, any rate, instead of uh, them running over Brian uh, and maiming him for life, uh, instead of stopping our demonstrations, we had uh, for two and a half years, Thousands of us uh, blocked these trains. And it was a statement to not only our government, but to the rest of the world that we really do believe that we're all children of God. And uh, we have a responsibility uh, not to uh, just obey our government and allow this kind of uh, insanity of war and destruction and violence to, to continue. Hmm. So, yeah. so I, I met people in, in Central America who had no newspapers, no radio, but they had heard about Brian Wilson and the people that were blocking uh, you know, trains carrying bombs to kill their people and were so deeply touched that there were Americans that, that uh, felt their pain and suffering. Yeah. And we're willing to even risk our lives to try to uh, stop this this madness. Uh, in two thousand uh, two, you established the Nonviolent Peace Force. You were part of a group that established that, and then in two thousand fourteen, you were instrumental in the creation of World Beyond War. Um, yes. Today, uh, at the end of the twenties. Uh, I mean, of, sorry, of the second decade of this century, do you feel that the anti-war progress is in a better position than, say, where it was? If I my my very superficial knowledge of this history tells me that we can roughly date this movement to about the 1920s, right? When the idea of uh, abolition of war <laughs> gathers momentum after the First World War. Mm -hmm. So a century later, what is your feeling about the prospects of countering violence in the pursuit of power between nations with nonviolence? How do you feel about that? I'm, I'm really yeah. more keen on, <clears throat> on what you're feeling more than, you know, just a historical analysis. <laughs> Well, that's a very important question. Um, I think in the uh, in the twenties, after the First World War, which was totally insane <laughs> war, um, that people and even governments had realized the insanity of uh, of uh, war as a means of resolving conflict, and uh, passed the Cal Kellogg Briand Pact, which yeah. made war illegal. Well, um, I, I think uh, <clears throat> today the danger of, of nuclear war is greater than uh, any time in history. The Bolton of Atomic so Scientists have, um, they, they have a nuclear clock. Yeah. And it was mm -hmm. 10 minutes to midnight and then five minutes to midnight. <laughs> And then two minutes to midnight, and now it's a hundred seconds from midnight. 
Um, why why is that so uh david because uh even very well informed people tend to believe that uh since the soviet union collapsed um that you know nuclear war is no longer a big threat to humanity many well informed people believe that so can you explain a bit in detail why we are actually in a worse position than before well um the uh when the the berlin wall came down <laughs> and the end of the cold war uh the united states made a commitment nato you know one inch eastward toward the russian border yeah. and now uh we have moved nato right up to the borders of russia yeah and our planes with nuclear weapons in them are flying right up to the border of russia uh and then turning back so that is happening on the, and the russian planes are all are also flying up to the border <laughs> with their nuclear weapons and when they got the border turned around um well th this is uh, and of course with nuclear missiles uh, it's much faster than planes. I mean, within minutes, we could incinerate hundreds of millions of people around the world. I mean, as you know, in Indian Pakistan, there's threats of nuclear weapons. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. and China. I mean, we're preparing for nuclear war with China. We're surrounding China with with the military bases, and. Uh, it's the same mentality that Brian Wilson was talking about. Somehow we think as Americans, <laughs> we have a right to have our military bases and our nuclear weapons and our, uh, our armed ships, you know, everywhere in the world. And we have over 800 military bases uh, in different parts of the world. And, you know, the, the, if China had 800 mil military bases <laughs> all around the world, uh, the rest of it. So um, anyway, world beyond war I, has people in uh, over 150 countries now, not governments, but peoples that are saying a war is insane. It's, uh, it's not working. I mean, the U.S. has spent trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, uh, and not only the United States, other weapons, other countries also, to, to try to get security through through military and, and nuclear weapons and preparations for war. Well, that has gotten us zero security from this virus, <laughs> which is killing people all around the world. It got zero security from uh, you know the the planes that uh, that uh, attacked the World Trade Center back in two thousand one. Uh, all of our trillions of dollars on on nuclear weapons and everything else has gotten us. Uh, we've not won a war. <laughs> we've not. No, well, I mean, you never win a war. Or when millions will die, but uh, we in Vietnam we lost that war. The Korean War was never resolved. The uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Here we've been fighting for twenty years. M millions of people are dead. Trillions of dollars have been spent that we can't spend on education. I mean, my my thought is, if in spend, instead of spending all this money on and wars and for wars, we were to, um, I mean, I think 3%, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I think 3% of what uh, the, the world is spending on, uh, on wars and preparations for wars, we could end world hunger. Yeah. Well, what if, what if the and, United States- And solve climate change. And solve climate change. And and you know medical uh, medical clinics for people all around the world. Uh, I mean, I think 
the United States could be the most loved nation in the world <laughs> if, if instead of preparing for ever more uh, horrendous nuclear wars, we were to say, look, all, everybody in the world is God's children. Let's put our money into building a decent life for every person on the planet. Yeah. Uh, in, in view of these realities, uh, David, how does the rest of this century look to you? Are you hopeful? Uh, or is it that all of us who are advocates of nonviolence will continue to be a kind of chorus on the side and um, the advocates of violence will continue to have their way? How does the rest of the century look to you? Because it is in many ways an unprecedented time. Yes. Particularly because of the... Well the way technology has changed. Yeah. Well, um, you know, one of, I mean, I, I'm a great uh, admirer of both Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King. But one of the things that, that King said was, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. <laughs> and, and I can't yes, I help but believe uh, that w with with the the uh, the uh, the minds and hearts and the uh, good thinking of people all around the world, we're going to allow ourselves just to destroy <laughs> the planet, yeah. both e either from nuclear war or from climate change, or from continuing to pretend that. Uh, I mean, so, so in some many nations, our nation is more important <laughs> than, than, than your nation. Yeah. Um, so, and I think people all around the world are discovering the power of nonviolent action and of nonviolent movements to create change. And uh, you probably know Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, who've written the book, Why Civil Resistance Works and have shown that nonviolent movements are more than twice as likely to be successful yeah. as violent movements. And all over the world, people, people power, nonviolent people power movements are uh, overthrowing uh, oppressive governments, governments that are not listening to the people. And, you know, President Eisenhower <laughs> was a general, in addition to being president, he, he once said, I want to believe that the people of the world want peace so much that governments will have to get out of the way and let them have it. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> and, and he also said that every battleship that we build, you know, means people are going to starve to death and, and not, not have a decent school, et cetera, because we're deciding to spend the money on uh, on battleships on on yeah. our, on military planes, but so I, I I think people of the world are waking up, and world beyond beyond war is trying to uh, bring together people all around the world who believe that there are uh, much more effective you know, and, and life-saving ways of resolving conflict than threatening each, each other with war. Yeah. And uh, we have written a book called, um, what is it called? Uh, we've written a book called A Global Security System, mm -hmm. An Alternative to War. Uh -huh. And, and uh, in this book, we have tried to look at all the ways that that exist that are really much more effective than to threaten each, each other with, with destruction. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's not a question of, do we know how to do it? We do know how to do it. Somehow we have to uh, bring our governments to understand uh, that there are more, you know, better ways to, to resolve conflict than threatening each other with war. And um, uh, yeah. so I, I guess I, uh, I have a friend that, that 
years ago said, I'm an optimist because I cannot afford to be a pessimist. <laughs> and, True. And, and so, it, you know, if we get to be a pessimist, yeah, you give up yeah. and you say there's no hope. Yeah. And uh, that will assure <laughs> that there's no hope. Yeah, and, so, and that's a short way of losing then and, 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 and letting violence win. So David, in closing, I would ask, what are the key learnings and advice that you would share with those? You know, you said many more people across the world are today getting involved in nonviolence, moving towards it, choosing it as the path. Uh, their method of struggle. Uh, what are some of the key learnings and advice that you would give to the younger people, the present and future travelers on this path of nonviolence and civil disobedience? You know, that would be enabling. What are some of the key strengths that you cultivated in your own life that, you know, gave you this kind of strength and energy to go for the long haul, which you have? Mm. Well, uh, in my book called Waging Peace, Global Adventures of a Lifelong Activist, um, toward the end of the book, I have 10 lessons learned from my life of activism. Mm. Uh, and I would uh, recommend this uh, book if, <laughs> if people would like to learn. I'm, I'm now 80, and I've probably spent, uh, uh, well, 65, 70 years of my life uh, involved in nonviolent movements. But um, so I can just share that very briefly, some of the points I make. But uh, one is just having a vision of a world you know, where we are living as brothers and sisters, uh, not as enemies and as <laughs> one nation versus the other. Um, a second is the oneness of all life, that we're all interconnected. We're not separate yeah. beings, nations, uh, peoples, whether we're Muslim or Hindu or a Christian or communist, uh, you know, <laughs> we're all brothers and sisters. Nonviolence as a powerful force. You know, uh, as, as I said, people all around the world are discovering the power of nonviolence as a, as a, as a means of change. Nurture your spirit whether that's through meditation, whether it's through nature, through its, uh, whether it's through music, friends, it's very important to take time to do that. Small committed groups can, can create change. Uh, I, I think as individuals, we have, have limited possibility to create change. As small groups of people, communities of change, we, we can make change. Um, Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to find some other people that believe in, in, in justice and peace. Uh, uh, and as, as deeply as you do and work together to help uh, create this change. The need for sustained struggle. You know, going out on a one-day demonstration, you know, I mean, that's a, it's a good thing to do. But as we've found in the civil rights movement, as God found in the, in the freedom struggle in India, as yeah. the women's, women's movement around the world, yeah. uh, we need sustained struggle to, to really uh, create change. We need to have good strategy. We need to think strategically, uh, where is it we're trying to go? Uh, how, do we, how realistically can we get there? Steps that we need to take. Who are our potential allies, et cetera? We need to overcome our fear. I think governments instill fear in people to help them be uh, subservient <laughs> to obey the governments. And as we found in the, the sit-ins in the South, when we overcame we, our fear is when we had power. Uh, truth. I mean, Gandhi said, uh, let your life, let our lives be experiment. 
governments with truth. Uh, I mean, gov governments are lying to people all the time. That's the way they get people to fight each other and and uh, threaten to kill each other. Yeah. <clears throat> I think we need to uh, make our lives based on truth uh, and love. And then we need to share our stories, similar to what I've tried to do in my book, in my book, um, that uh, share our success stories where we have uh, overcome hatred with love, uh, where we have uh, overcome nationalism and uh, religious, you know, religious nationalism <laughs> with, uh, with uh, building caring communities, you know, national and religious and community borders. So anyway, those are some of the uh, main lessons that I've learned, but, but realize that uh, you're not alone we're not alone. There are people all around the world that uh, <clears throat> care as deeply as you do uh, for our children and grandchildren and for, for future generations. And I would encourage people to go to um, worldbeyondwar.org. You can sign a pledge to uh, join with people from other parts of the world to uh, work nonviolently to help create a world uh, of peace and justice. Thank you so much. Thank 